Well, today we begin our message and conclude our sermon series on the Ten Commandments. Amazing that what we have found in the Ten Commandments is that whenever God speaks to Moses, he tells him, he said, I am the one who has brought you out of Egypt, I brought you out of the land of slavery, and here is my agreement, my covenant with you as in doing these ten things. Now, the people of Israel, we know the Israelites take and they add on even more uh, and make it almost to the point of being legalistic. But God is saying, this is how you live in freedom, by doing these ten. And we've learned that throughout the sermon series. Today we come to the final of the Ten Commandments. And the final one is one that maybe we might not consider ourselves guilty of, but it can be very easy to fall into the trap. And the final commandment is found in Exodus chapter 20, verse 17. The word of the Lord says the following, and this will be our foundation text. Do not covet your neighbor's house. Do not covet your neighbor's wife, his male or female slave, his ox or his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Now, when we stop there and think about for a moment, what does it mean to covet? What does it mean to have covetedness in our hearts? Well, to make it just as simple as possible, covetous means that what you see that someone else have that you want it so bad you're willing to sin to get it. Is it wrong that if your neighbor gets a, a riding lawnmower and you have a push mower for you to say, well, you know what, I sure would love to have a riding lawnmower. It'd make it a whole lot more easier to cut this acre grass with a riding mower than a push mower. No, that's nothing wrong in that. But if you're willing to go and steal your neighbor's riding lawnmower that you want it so bad, you say, you know what, he doesn't deserve it, I deserve it, I'm going to take it. Well, that's where covetous comes in. Or if the only thing you can think of is how can the Lord bless him with a riding lawnmower? I'm just as good as he is. I should be blessed with that riding lawnmower. Then we start getting into the sin of covetedness. Covetous is what happens, let me give you this, in the heart. It begins in that location. Now we find several scripture passages that remind us of covenants, but let me show you exactly what God is saying to us. First, let's look in the New Testament, the James chapter 1, verse 15. Notice the writer here says, Then after desire has been conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is fully grown, it gives birth to death. Notice what he's saying there. He, he's talking about covetousness. Where does desire begin? It begins at a conception point. It's been conceived. And when it's conceived in the heart, it says it begins to grow. Satan wants nothing more than to whisper into your life and say, you deserve that. And you deserve it so much that even if you have to do something that the world calls wrong to get, then go ahead and do it because you deserve it. Maybe you want to covet someone that says here in Exodus, remember what it says, don't covet your neighbor's wife, don't covet their spouse. And sometimes people do that and say, well, maybe you go home and your spouse says to you, you can provide more for me if you were like so-and-so's husband who had that good job. Or maybe you come home and you say, you know, I, I was able to go out to eat with my friends and and he was talking about his wife is such a great cook. Oh, I wish I had a wife like that. You might say, well, that's a good way to get the frying pan upside your head. <laughs> Understand that what we're going at here is that in the heart, it dwells, it eats away at you. And to what takes place? The action. And then the action takes place, it says it leads to death. And then we'd look over to Colossians chapter 3, verse 5. If you have your Bible still open and want to turn over to Colossians 3, 5, it says, Therefore put to death what belongs to your worldly nature. Who puts it to death? You put it to death. If you have that desire in your heart that's going to lead to sin, then what you do is you say, I'm not going to give in to this. I'm going to fight it, not with my own strength, but I'm going to fight it through the power of the Holy Spirit and that I'm going to put it to death. The problem is, is we've allowed our evil desires not to be put to death. We've just put them in the ground and threw a little bit of dirt on it and say, oh yeah, that sin is put to death. 
when it actually isn't put to death. That when nobody's looking, we run back over to the grave and we start, are you okay? Whew. And nobody was looking just then and I wanted to make sure, are you okay, sin? And then you bring sin back out of the grave. Are you following? And you say, sin, now we can party, we can play. Sin, we can have everything we want. And then somebody comes along, maybe a, a brother in Christ, your pastor, a deacon, a Sunday school teacher, or just someone that you love in the Lord, and they come along and you say, uh-oh, they're going to know i got this sin. Let me go throw it back in the grave and throw a little dirt over it. No, that sin's not been put to death. How does it get put to death? We take it to Christ on the cross and say, I'm dealing with this sin. I'm dealing with coveting. I want what my neighbor has. I want what my whatever has. And I don't want to have these evil desires. Lord, will you kill it for me? And he will. You take it to the Lord and you leave it there with him and allow the Lord to deal with that. And it says that that is what? This worldly desire, sexual immorality. So the sexual immorality need to be put in the grave, need to be buried and put to death? Oh, yes. You know, it doesn't take long in this world to come across something that's sexually immoral, does it? You have to put it to death. And then it says also impurity, lust, evil desires. Evil desires in the original talks about the covetousness. It greed. Greed is what? Idolatry. They call greed the green-eyed monster because why? Because what you see is just uh, you want it, you desire it, you need it in your life. And that leads us today to a very familiar Old Testament passage in which says there's a man by the name of Ahab. And it's one of the great examples of covetousness and greed that we can find in the Bible. It's one of these great examples because it paints the picture and it shows you how it leads to his downfall. But if you look in the Old Testament, let's look together. It's in 1 Kings chapter 21. 1 Kings, that's the Old Testament, chapter 21, verse 1 through 16. Now, today this is where we're going to spend the majority of our time, talking about covenants, talking about Ahab, and talking about his wife that many of you probably know quite well or have heard of, Jezebel. The Bible says these words, and I'm reading from the Holman translation. Sometime passed after these events, and Naboth the Jezreelite, Jezreelite had a vineyard that was in Jezreel next to the palace of Ahab, the king of Samaria. And so Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard so I can have it for a vegetable garden, since it is right next to my palace. I will give you a better vineyard in its place. Or, if you prefer, I will give you what its value in silver. But Naboth said to Ahab, I will never give my father's inheritance to you. So Ahab went to his palace. He was resentful and angry and he became it because of what Naboth had said. And it says that he had told him, I will not give you my father's inheritance. And he laid down on the bed, he turned his face away, and he didn't eat any food. And then his wife Jezebel came in to him and she said, Why are you so upset that you refuse to eat? Because I spoke to Naboth, the Jezreelite, and he responded to me and replied, I told him, give me your vineyard for silver, or if you wish, I will give you a vineyard in its place. But he said, I won't give you my vineyard. And then his wife Jezebel, it says, said to him, Now exercise your royal power over Israel, get up, eat some food, and be happy, for I will give you the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite. And so she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal. And she sent the letters to the elders and the nobles who lived with Naboth in the city. And the letters she wrote said the following. Proclaim a fast. Set Naboth at the head of the people. And then set two wicked men opposite of him and have them testify against him saying, You have cursed God and the king. And then take him out and stone him. The men of the city and the elders and the nobles that lived in his city did as Jezebel had commanded him and as was written in the letters that she had sent. 
And they proclaimed a fast, and they said to Naboth, Naboth at the head of the people. And the two wicked men came in, and they sat opposite of him. And then the wicked men testified against Naboth, and in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth has cursed God and the king. And so they took him outside the city, and they stoned him to death with stones. And then they sent word to Jezebel, Naboth has been stoned to death. And when Jezebel... Jezebel heard that Naboth had been stoned to death. She said to Ahab, Get up, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, who refused to give it to you for silver, and since Naboth isn't alive but dead. Verse 16. And when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, he got up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth, the Jezreelite, to take possession of it. Let's stop there for a moment. Now, this is an interesting because it almost could be that of a plot of a movie. And the reason why I say that is because what you have here is a king, Ahab, who had everything. He had actually more land than Naboth. But yet, even though he had so much, he still wanted more. It's almost as if the person that you've seen that says, Gimme, 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 they're never satisfied. They have an endless pit that can never be filled. Regardless, if you give them a million dollars, it would never be enough. Regardless, if you take them out to eat and buy them the most expensive steak there was, it would never be enough. Regardless, if you gave them the keys to a brand new car, it would never be enough. How many of you know there's some of us raising children that are like that? You could give them and give them and give them everything. And it still will never be enough. Some of us know people like that. Some of us are married to people like that. Some of us have children like that. Some of us work for people like that. You work all your hours and it's still never enough for your employer. You see, it's not the problem. You're not the issue. What the issue is is the spirit that dwells inside of that person. What we have here is King Ahab. He first, we find out, he's married to Jezebel. Jezebel is not an Israelite. She's not someone that is worshiping the Lord. In fact, when Ahab marries her and brings her into the kingdom, the kingdom's already divided, the northern kingdom and the southern kingdom. And he brings her in, and when he brings her in, he brings her in as someone who's also going to bring in her own gods. That's why the Bible says it's so important that this be equally yoked. She brings in her own gods, and her primary god that she worshipped was this god Baal. She brings in, and I was doing some research on this, it says Jezebel brought in 450 priests. Her husband built a temple in Samaria for those priests to worship Baal, and ultimately to try to convert the Jewish people to worship Baal. She brought in then 400 priests to Jezreel, and her husband built a temple there so that they could worship Baal. So you have 850 priests that have been brought into Israel to basically do what? To pollute the true worship of Yahweh, of God. And so this is going on. Well, whenever her husband, King Ahab, looks out every day, he sees something that entices him. You remember that King David had a problem when he went out on the palace, top of, the, of his area, and looks out, he sees a woman taking a bath by the name of Bathsheba. He covets his neighbor's wife to the point he's willing to put that man to death so he could have his neighbor's wife. King David committed murder. King David also committed adultery. But King David also was someone who was forgiven. Because how many of you know, even if you're ever guilty of covetous, that leads to sin, that if you go and seek God out with a humility, that God can forgive you of the sin of covetousness. Ahab looks out. He sees this piece of land. He thinks to himself, you know what? It will be great to have a garden there. Now, could he have planted a garden anywhere else? Oh, yo, absolutely. The Bible says he had plenty of land. In fact, he had enough land that he says to, to the owner of this land, Naboth, he says, I will trade land with you. I'll give you a better piece of land. Neighbor says, no. 
this land was in my in my family's it's in generation after generation. I'm not giving this land to you regardless of what you have to offer me. So then King Ahab says, what if I were to give you even more money than what the land's worth? How many of you know that they are no longer making land? And in Israel, you might say, why would Naboth be so adamant not to trade land for better land or to sell land for more than what it's worth? How many of you understand that if you start studying the Israelite Jewish traditions about land, then you understand it wasn't that Naboth was being stubborn or being you know hard to get along with. Naboth was actually following biblical code when it came to land in Israel. I will prove it to you. <clears throat> if you're taking notes, it's not going to be on the screen, so you have to just write it down or see me later. Ezekiel 46, 18 talks about not saving the land or selling the land, not trading it out, keep the land in your family. Numbers 36 verse 7 says the same thing. Leviticus 25, 23 and Leviticus 25 verse 25. All of those scriptures and plus I could give you more but those are four scriptures that come right out and says don't sell your land don't give your land up because the land was a gift from God to each of the 12 tribes. And the way you identify yourself as a tribe is the land that you possess. One thing if you remember that God was adamant about, I have given you this land. This is promised land to go out and conquer it and take it over, but it's already yours. So when you give up something, either by selling it or trading it, what you're saying is, God, the blessings you've given to me, obviously, is not as great as it needs to be. I'm going to get better blessings, better land, more money. How many of you know that when God gets hold of something, it's so much more than what the world can offer you? Amen? And that's what's happening in here. So when Naboth says, not for sale, He wasn't being a jerk, all right? He was just simply following the biblical principles of land in Israel. Now, I I was teasing with someone, I said that a real estate agent would be in in bad shape in Israel uh, because they, they wouldn't have a lot of work. But Ahab couldn't just take no. Is this for sale? No, it's not for sale. So he goes home and it says that he pouts. He whines. He cries about it. He won't even eat. He puts on a show. If Ahab could have fell on the floor and kicked his feet like a little three-year-old, I want that land. He would have done it. But he did everything but that. And so Jezebel, his wife, comes in there and she sees her husband laying in the bed, facing the wall. He's not eating, and we don't know the exact amount of time, but he's not eating enough that we notice that obviously the words got out with the cooks and the servants. Something's wrong with the king. The king's not eating. The king's laying around doing nothing. He's moping. Something's wrong. He is what we would call clinically depressed. But I will say this to you is that what the problem was is he was oppressed by an evil spirit. And what the evil spirit was doing was putting in his heart, get it. You want it. You deserve it. And how many of you know that he might, not, he might have just moped and moped and moped his whole life about it. Every time I wanted, I wanted that land. Why didn't he sell me that land? He might have just done that his whole life. But the, <laughs> the enemy will put the right person in your life to get you to do the wrong thing. Y'all not getting it. The enemy... Satan will put the right individual, it might even be the person you marry. Satan says, I'm going to put this beautiful man, this beautiful woman in your life. You're going to fall madly, lustfully in love with them. Notice I use the word lustfully because you're thinking not as a Christian, you're thinking about the outside. And you're going to make a covenant with this person. You're going to get an agreement with this person. And then you wonder why your marriage is so all messed up. Satan allowed this person to come in. That's why I always say, be careful 
who you allow your children to go on dates with because eventually someone they date will eventually become their spouse. Right? I mean, that's true, folks. So Satan, now does that mean that God can't change someone, clean them up? Oh, God can do anything God wants to do. I know that. I understand that. But at this time, in this juncture, at this time of, of the story of the Bible, it's telling us that the enemy placed, and how do we know the enemy did it? Because who does she worship? Not the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. She worships the God of Baal. And so the, Satan has allowed this woman to come and be in such an authoritative position in the government that she has an influence to speak into her husband, not life, but death. I will say something to you. If you have a spouse, speak life into them. And be their number one encourager. Be their number one fan. Be their number one supporter. Because the world is beating your spouse down at home, at, at, at work, and it comes home. They're beating them down at the, at, if they are uh, in the school teaching or whatever. Trust me, wherever you're at, how many of you know the world is beating your spouse down? The last thing they need is to walk in the door and get beaten down at home. They need to be encouraged and lifted up and, and, and told, I love you. I believe in you because you are my helpmate. And so what we see here is that Ahab, because he's joined in with Jezebel, Jezebel goes in there and she tells him, she speaks the words of Satan into him. You want it? Get up and wipe your face off. Go get something to eat. Don't you know who you are? You're the king. Act like it. Now I'll ask you something. Who was running the show of the government? Was it Ahab? Or was it Jezebel? It was Jezebel, right? <laughs> so what we see here is that Jezebel wants control. And so she comes up with a scheme. And you might say, well, Ahab's innocent of it. No, he's not innocent of it. How I know about it is because he goes along with it. He, he it allows his wife to take over. Now I will make a controversial statement. But it's a biblical statement. Men, you're the head of your house. You're not a dictator. But you're the head of the house, meaning that you have a responsibility in your home. Does that lessen the value of your wife? Absolutely not. Why do you think God allowed Eve to be taken from the side of Adam? I also believe because your wife should walk with you and what decisions that you as the head of the house, you have discussed it with your wife, you're in prayer about it, it and your wife might have something that she comes to you and you say, you know what, you're exactly right. There's a lot of times my wife has something that she'll say to me, and I'm like, why didn't I think of that? You're right. Now, if I were to say, you're to be quiet, I'm the head of the house, then, I mean, come on, right? What I'm getting at is that this king gave up his spiritual authority in the home by marrying a pagan. And by doing so, he now is given in to the influences. Notice one or the other is going to win. Good or evil, one, it cannot co-mingle. And so what happens? He gives in. She comes up with this plan. She says, let's do this. Let's, let's get and have a, a big feast, but we'll have first a fast. Meaning nobody's to eat, they're to pray. And if you study Jewish tradition, the only time you actually call for a fast is that there's something wrong. But do you notice in the story of the Bible, it never tells you what, why they called the fast? Now we know that why is because they're going to try to set up Naboth with two people that are liars to say that he blasphemed God and the king. Right? But a true fast is because there was a natural, a natural, um, uh, the nation was in turmoil, but that was not what the case is. So let's just speed everything up real quick. So we get to the point that she sends out letters, they have this big meal, and they decide to have Naboth in the, the head seat. Let me just say this, you be very careful when people start putting you in the top seat. Be very careful when somebody lifts you up. 
If it ain't God lifting you up, be very careful because they might be lifting you up so that you can what? Have even a bigger fall. Right? Yeah, they're setting you up. They were setting him up. But even during all that, was God still in control? Absolutely. I want to give you something that I guarantee you, this sermon you've probably heard preached by pastors all throughout your life. But I'm going to give you something I guarantee you the majority of pastors have not told you. Naboth is the type image of Christ in this story. Let me tell you why. Naboth was lied against. Was Christ lied against? Yes. Naboth was charged with blasphemy against God. Jesus, if you remember what did they say he was? He was blasphemous against God, right? Naboth will later, after a make-believe trial, and did not Jesus go through some kind of stage kangaroo trial? Yes. That later Naboth will be stoned to death, but yet Jesus will also be put to death on the cross. Do you notice there's a parallel? All through what happened, Naboth stayed faithful to God. And so did Jesus, right? Thousands of years apart, but there's still a pattern there if you look at it, right? Let's continue. So what we have in this story of covenants is that three main characters of the evil. One, Ahab was wicked, but he was weak. Jezebel, she was wicked, but she was strong. And then the elders who went along with this lie, and they did. They went along with it. They got the letter and it says, hey, pretend like Naboth is wrong. He's guilty because we want to have him put to death. They went along with it. So they were what? They were wicked and submissive. Three types of sin. Weak, strong, and submissive in those three characters. Okay? So at the end of all of this, Naboth dies. And Ahab gets what he wants. He said, well, wait a minute, Pastor. I thought you said that in Ezekiel and Numbers and Leviticus that the land is to stay with the family, whatever tribe. So Naboth, it would stay in his family, his, his children or his nephews or somebody in the family, right? I mean, I showed you that in Scripture. So why wouldn't it go? And then, then King Ahab had the same problem with a family member. I'm glad you asked. Y'all asked some good questions, I didn't tell you. The reason why that now Ahab can step up and get the land is because in Judaism, and at that time, that if you were put to death as a criminal, the possession that you own, the land you had, would be surrendered and turned over to the government. Do you not think that Jezebel knew the rules enough that she was able to manipulate it and say, no, no, we're not just going to kill him, but we're going to charge him and bring this false lie, this lie against him so that we can get this land for you. It, the land wasn't the issue. What the issue was was the sin and all that went on behind the scenes to get that land. I'll say this to you today. There's people right now, I know for a fact, in Pender County that will go and see if somebody's a day behind on their taxes and they'll try to do quick, quick claim deeds. Uh, they'll try to steal people's land from underneath them. There are people, I mean, come on, why do you think we have to have lawyers to make sure that the land is, is in good shape, that there's not someone that else owns the land? Because people out there are not always honest, are they? Now, there's nothing wrong with buying land and selling land. That's not the case. But if you have such a greed that you're like, oh, I can't wait until that person passes away so I can just go in and offer a certain amount of money and just take what they have. I'm going to tell you a little story. How many of you ever drank a Coca-Cola? You ever drank a Coca-Cola? How many of you probably need a Coke right now to wake up? I mean, <laughs> the Coca-Cola Empire. Okay, now listen to me. I'm going to bring this home to modern day and we're going to wrap it all up real for you. The Coca-Cola Empire, the day the man, that act, the man who actually created the ingredients for Coca-Cola, when he died, his wife was there at the grave with their son. They had debt. They had other stuff that they had to take care of. The man who 
took the claim of the Coca-Cola ingredients, was there that day. He shows up knowing they have bills to pay. And he says, um, I tried to buy the ingredients and the name rights to, for Coca-Cola from your husband, but at the time he was not willing to sell. I see that you have bills that need to be paid. I'm willing to pay you now cash money. You say, well, it's just a business transaction. Isn't it amazing though he does it at the grave site? I mean, think about this. There was something covetous about it. Oh, I want it so bad, and I'm willing to wait till the man drops dead who had it. And when he drops dead, I'm going to go to his wife when she is in a state of mind that she's sad and upset, and when her children are there, and I'm going to pull out cash and say, I've got cash money. Are you ready? And oh, and by the way, I have the documents that we can sign to make this legal. Right? There's historians that study this kind of thing, say it was one of the greatest transactions that probably took place business-wise at a gravesite. Covenants. That's what really what it was, right? It's exactly what it was. And you might say, well, Pastor, I wouldn't do anything like that. But have you coveted something so much that you're willing to rob from God and not give God what was His so that you could buy it with your money that actually was wrong to God. Yeah, that's fine. You don't have to amen that. What I'm getting at today in the last moments we're together is that covenants, you might not have to kill someone, but if you want something so bad that you just wish that person would die so you can get it, that's covenant. I, I will say this to you, I have counseled people in the past 25 years Elderly people, I've talked with them when they're trying to get their wills in order. And one thing that I've found very sad, and I remember this case uh, in Roseboro. I was pastoring a church up there, and there was this elderly lady, sweet as she could be. And she was working on her will, and she talked to me about it. And she was saying, you know, Pastor, she says, I just know that they're just sitting around waiting for me to die. I said, why do you say that? Well, because when they come to visit, the only thing they talk about is that, and I'm not going to say her name, but so-and-so, when you do die, I sure love to have that car. So-and-so, when you pass away and go on to be with the Lord, I sure love to have. And they were, I mean, it's like they were picking off things, like a bunch of buzzards, right? You might say, oh, pastor, come on. It, it was, Really? I guarantee you, if you think hard enough, you know people yourself that when they die, their families will be flocking around like buzzards waiting to see what they can get. You know why? It's because of covenants. What are you coveting? What do you want so bad that you're willing to sin for? Let's close out this message with this. God loves you. If you have coveted, if you are guilty of this, God Almighty can forgive you. That's good news. You come to church and it says, oh, the pastor just tells me all oh, what's bad, what's bad. No, I'm telling you, here is what the diagnosis is. But the good news is that you can be forgiven. You can be forgiven. And you know, coveting something, it could be education. I know years ago, whenever I didn't have nothing more than a high school degree, and I'd have all these other pastors come do revivals, and they'd have seminary degrees and doctorate degrees and all that, I would think to myself, oh, I'd love to, I'd love to have what they want, have got. Oh, I want it so, I'd wanted it. But I didn't want it so bad that I was willing to sin for it. But I, I was just, you know, I was enamored by it. I was just amazed by it. But now I realize this. I'd rather have a God-fearing, Holy Ghost-filled pastor in the pulpit that can only read and write than I had someone that's got 10 degrees on the wall that has never had a relationship with Jesus. Amen? I mean, that's the case. I'd rather, instead of me having a brand new car that's going to cause me all these problems, I'd rather still drive all what I have. Now, a nice car, nothing wrong with that. But what I'm getting at is that don't want something so much that it causes you to sin. Because what will happen is you'll get your eyes on something that you won't be able to take with eternity. And when you get to eternity, you'll realize, wait a minute, I'm here at this certain place because I wanted something so bad. I coveted it. And now look at me in hell.